So today is our debut episode of the Andrew Burnett Show on WOTG TV. And today we have a very special guest. He is an American public speaker, author, educator, and advocate for Christian apologetics. Will you help me welcome Alex McFarland? Alex, how are you doing today? Well, I'm great, Andrew, and it's so good to be with you. And uh, I'm doing good because I'm enjoying have a, having a conversation with you, my friend. Well, that's awesome. So how did you become interested in Christian apologetics? Well, uh, first of all, thanks for asking and thanks for having me on your show. It's it's a great honor to be here. Um, Andrew, when I was in college, I started going to a Bible study. And at age 21 years old, through a Monday night Bible study, I understood the gospel and the love of Jesus. He died on the cross for my sins. And I asked Christ to come into my life and be my savior. And within about two or three days, I was at college and some of my friends that were not believers started asking me all kinds of questions. You know, how do you know the Bible is true? How do you really know Jesus rose from the dead? And this was in the 1980s, so this was 30 years ago. But I went to a bookstore and look, I'd only been a believer about 72 hours and I really didn't know anything about anything. But I found a couple of books by a guy named Josh McDowell on evidence for the Bible. And I'm convinced right now, but I was convinced back then that people need to know why God is real, the Bible is true, Jesus is the savior. And I, I really got into apologetics, trying to be a witness to a lot of my friends at college. That's kind of how it started. Did, had no clue, brother, I had no clue that God would call me into the ministry and that really into apologetics it would become my my life's work. I didn't know at that point. That is so awesome. So tell us, you know, right now in America, I think we're more in need of a savior than we're in need of anything. With all of this coronavirus and earthquakes and wildfires and everything going on, I'm sure there are going to be somebody watching that would ask themselves, why would God allow so much evil to just come into the world? Share with us a little bit about your opinion on that. Well, well, thanks for asking. And do you know that is probably the most common question about apologetics? Uh, I mean, people might ask about the manuscripts of the Bible and archaeology, but the number one question, because it, it hits us emotionally, why is there so much pain and suffering in the world? And, you know, the fact is, Andrew, that this is a fallen world. This is a world of sin. And the Holy Spirit of God is always calling out to people, offering the right way to go, and people do the wrong thing. But, but let me give you an illustration. Imagine you're walking in the woods, and you come up on a house, and the house is abandoned, and the house is, uh, the windows are broken, and the floorboards are rotting out, and the roof is leaking and falling in. If you saw a house that was badly damaged like that, you, you wouldn't say, oh, there was no builder or no architect. You would simply say the house is broken and needs to be fixed. That's kind of how the world is. I've debated a lot of atheists, and they'll say, well, you know, there's, there's pain and suffering and violence and terrorism, and there's, there's bad stuff. Therefore, there must not be a God. No, just like the house that's rotting away, it simply means that the place is broken and needs to be fixed. All of the evil in the world simply illustrates how desperately we need we need a savior, Jesus Christ. And you know, I mean, I get in debates like you're saying with atheists on Facebook. And one of the most questions that I get myself is how can this God that you love so much wreak, ha <clears throat> wreak havoc on America? Hmm. And I say, God doesn't wreak the havoc on America. The enemy does. But yes, just like we see in the Bible, when Job was tempted by the devil, God does allow him to tempt us, but he only allows him to take it so far. Yeah, that's good. And hey, thank you for standing up for Christianity on Facebook and on, on the internet. You know, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, a lot of atheists, that they'll, they'll dialogue with me and, and they'll say that too. And they'll say, you know, um, this, this, and this is wrong. How could God cause that? I'll say, well, God didn't cause it. God doesn't cause sin. And sin is, is that which brings death. 
and God is the foundation of all life. So there's no sin in God. There's no evil in God because God is, is everlasting, eternal, and sin is death and, and, and darkness and destruction. But, but here's the reality. If there was no God, then it would really make no sense to say this is good or that is bad. See, without God, there's no good or bad. There's just stuff. And, and the, the evolutionists will say things like, you know, well, for millions of years, there was uh, survival of the fittest and things died and the more fit species survived. And I'm like, look, your whole worldview, godlessness, secular evolution, your worldview depends on death and decay. Uh, but why do you look at this world and then blame God for death and decay? Listen, the only way, the only way that we can meaningfully say this is good, that is bad, there's an immovable ultimate standard that we measure from. I, I think about this, and I want your response, Andrew. Like if we look at, say, Mother Teresa, Billy Graham, we said that their life was good. We look at Adolf Hitler, Osama bin Laden, their life was bad. What we are really saying is the life of a Mother Teresa helping the lepers and orphans. Her life conforms more closely to an ultimate standard of good than Adolf Hitler. And so when an atheist says, there is no God, very often I'll ask a question, I'll say, really, honestly, you think the life of an Adolf Hitler is no different than a life of a Billy Graham? I mean, do you really want a world where an Osama bin Laden terrorist is no worse or better than a Mother Teresa? The only way we can make judgments, good, bad, moral, immoral, is if there's a God that we, that we can measure from. And so, yes, it's a fallen world, it's a painful world, but that, that doesn't mean there's no God, it just means that we need to be changed. And that change comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And you know, you're sitting here talking about the good versus the bad. That brings to my memory what Jesus talked about in the Bible. And, and, you know, we will know the person by the fruit that they bear. Just like you, you talked about, I mean, we can look at Billy Graham and we can see all of the souls that he's won. But we can look at Osama bin Laden and look at all the people he killed. There's a big difference there. I mean, we're going from soul saving to soul killing. Mm. I mean, I mean God is in the soul saving business and God wouldn't want nobody to kill anybody. Matter of fact, it says in the 10 commandments that we don't need to kill nobody. Exactly. So, so, I mean, you know, it gets me that this younger generation thinks that evolution is the answer. And I always tell somebody, and I don't mean it jokingly, but some people take it jokingly. I say, you know, if you were an evolutionist, get a, get your picture and get a monkey's picture and put them side by side and compare the likeness. There's no way. Yeah. I mean, I was created in the image of God. And, you know, you know, he's my creator. So, you know what? I, I claim to be a child of the king. I'm, I'm not kin to no monkey last time I checked. Exactly, exactly. Well, and, and you know this, I mean, think about this. Uh, and I would love, Andrew, with your permission, I want to come back and let's do a whole show critiquing evolution at some point. But evolution is a, a faith position. Because, I mean, for, for evolution and, and godlessness to be true, if, if this is a secular world with no God, look, something came from nothing. Chaos was the mother of order. You know, inanimate matter produced structure and life. But here's the thing for which evolution has no answer. You know, even if, even if there was rocks and dirt and Darwin's primordial soup, where did consciousness come from? Because here's the thing, animals and humans have consciousness. And uh, in, in a world of just this muddy swamp, Darwin said there was, quote, somewhere a warm little pond. How did consciousness come about? How did mud become mind? I mean, there's no answers for this. And yet Christianity says, look, there is a God, an all-powerful being, and God created. And you know, even secular science says the universe had a beginning. 
Something had to cause that beginning. Every effect has a cause, and the cause of the universe, in fact, the cause of our very life is God, the creator. Wow, what an awesome thing. So I see that we're close to the end of time for you today. So before we close out, tell folks how they can find a little bit about you. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks very much. Yeah, my website is just my name, alexmcfarland.com. And we are on Facebook and we do uh, Monday, Wednesday and Friday. We do a live webcast and, and the Facebook page is Rev Alex McFarland. Now, I had a, a regular Facebook page, but we we hit 5,000 friends, and so we had to go to a public page. So R-E-V, Rev Alex McFarland, and then my own website. You know, uh, Andrew, prior to this COVID coronavirus quarantine, I, I traveled, I spoke like three places a week for 22 years, 2,000 churches, 200 universities. And so we're doing everything online. I do hope to resume my travel schedule once the coronavirus is over. Um, if I could give a, a shout out, uh, July 27, I'm going to be at the Cove, the Billy Graham Training Center outside of Asheville, and I'll be teaching the book of Revelation, uh, how God writes history in advance. Now that's going to be July 27 through August 1st, we hope, assuming the quarantine is over. But for anybody that sees this, I would love to meet them in person at the Cove this, this August when I teach through the book of Revelation. Well, thank you so much, Alex, for coming on the program today. I have enjoyed you. You are welcome back anytime, and I just thank you for coming on. Andrew, you're a blessing. You're doing a great work, and you keep on keeping on, my friend. Well, thank you so much. God bless you.